One of the oldest videos on my channel is a playthrough of Pokemon Red with just a Lickitung. When I started making these videos, I did playthroughs with Pokemon like Butterfree and Beedrill. And then when I did Lickitung, it was much easier. Like that video is 11 minutes long. Uh, it seems impossible for me to make an 11 minute video these days. However, since I made that video so long ago, I didn't collect any metrics, and so I'll have to do a replay of Lickitung. Also, I want to make sure that I do it in my home game, which is Pokemon Yellow. So today, I'm going to be Yellow version with only a Lickitung. Let's get into it. This thing is not one of my favorite Generation 1 designs, and it's probably one of the Pokemon that I forget the most of the original 151. That's probably because the developers really didn't spotlight this thing within the game. There are no prominent trainers that feature one as a part of their team, and it's also only accessible in Cerulean Cave in the post game. Plus, it doesn't have stats that you really want to write home about. It has 90 HP, 55 attack, 75 defense, 60 special, and 30 speed, which gives it only a 5.86% chance to crit. Luckily, it's not all bad for Lickitung, because it is a normal type, so it only has one weakness to fighting type moves, and believe me, fighting types are not very good in Generation 1. Plus, its move pool is incredibly diverse. It starts the game with Rap and Supersonic, and then through level up it learns Stomp, Disable, Defense Curl, Slam, and Screech. Obviously Stomp at only level 7 is excellent, base 65 power, and a 30% chance to flinch, it's outstanding. Also Defense Curl can be used to trigger the badge boost, and while it's not the best badge boosting move, I think the ones that boost defense stats are the worst, at least it can be triggered 6 times to boost all your other stats. Through TM and HM, it learns pretty much everything, like both the water moves, both the ice moves, all the fighting moves, both the electric moves, notably it does not learn Thunder Wave, and then it gets Earthquake as well. Just in case you want to be a little bit risky with your playthrough, you could also teach it Fire Blast or Surf. However, I typically avoid these moves, specifically because Fire Blast only has 85% accuracy, and Surf can never be removed from your moveset. There is no move deleter in Generation 1. If you remember the guy in Fuchsia City, you're actually thinking about the remakes. The very first move deleter was introduced into the series in Generation Generation 2. So now as the playthrough gets started, I want to mention a sort of anti-synergy between Rap, Stomp, and Lickitung's speed stat. This thing is very slow, and as a result I'm probably not going to be able to outspeed Brock's Onyx, after all it's very fast, and that means I won't be able to trap it in Rap endlessly. Also that means I won't be outspeeding with Stomp, and as a result I won't be able to cause the opponent to flinch. Now moving second against the Onyx can be a great liability because it has the move Bide. As a result, it seems like there isn't a way for me to fully prevent damage from this move. Yes, it only accumulates damage on the first turn of a multi-turn move like Wrap, so that's one way to minimize damage. However, there's another interaction that I think everyone should be aware of, and that's how Supersonic interacts with Bide. First of all, it could just miss. So if you confuse a Pokemon that's accumulating energy during Bide, and then that Pokemon hits itself in confusion, Bide will just be cancelled. As a result, I should be able to use Lickitung's first three moves to be able to defeat Brock. However, I also want to mention that there's an interesting interaction between Bide and Disable, because that'll be relevant if I have to level up to 15. If the opponent uses Bide, and then Disable, which picks a random move to Disable by the way in Generation 1, if it disables Bide, then they're stuck until the disable counter wears off, and then Bide starts accumulating energy again. The funny thing is, if Bide is being used and it gets disabled, the opponent can't do anything. They just have to wait. So this has the potential to completely immobilize Brock's Onyx. But today I'm hoping that the power of the same type attack bonus in combination with Stomp is going to be all that I need. So after defeating the junior trainer in Brock's gym, Lickitung levels up to level 10, and now I'm ready to try Brock for the first time. Let's see how this goes. Geodude's first. I go for Stomp. It does a decent amount of damage, but what's more concerning is how much Geodude is dealing to me. While I am able to knock it out, Lickitung only survives with red hit points, and that means that it's very unlikely that I knock the Onyx out. I don't like to reset in situations like this because sometimes the AI really drops the ball. However, it doesn't today, and that's the first reset for Lickitung. So I'll need to do more training and level up. At this point, I should mention that you're all probably very aware that this is my old overlay. And that's because this playthrough was filmed on June 29th. I actually considered boxing this footage entirely and never using it on the channel. 
However, there's a reason that I think it's important to go through this playthrough, and that reason will become apparent much later on in the video. So just hang in there with me. Also, I should mention during this video that I was fortunate enough to work with two amazing people on the production of this video. So thank you so much, Angie and Brian, for making this process really fun. They sat with me while I did the playthroughs and we talked through things together. It was really an enjoyable experience. Also, Brian drew the Lickitung art that is going to show up at various points during this video. So thank you for that. Now, because this is an older playthrough, I wasn't yet aware of damage rounding. So I go back and I fight Brock at level 14, which doesn't make the most sense like I should have tried 13 and then I should have tried 15. Now Stomp looks like it's going to knock his lead out in 5 hits. It does, and then Onyx is next. Unfortunately, I'm still not faster than this thing. It has 23 speed, so I'd need 24 to move first, but Lickitung only has 19. Now I should mention another glitch about Bide, because we're going to see it play out here. It accumulated damage from Stomp, and then I confused Onyx with Supersonic. However, it's only a 2 turn Bide, and Onyx pays back the damage on the next turn without hitting itself. It actually does a lot to Lickitung. The reason is, is that if you deal damage to an opponent that's accumulating with Bide, and then use a status move that has an effect on the next turn, it counts the damage that was dealt on the first turn again on the second turn. So in this case, because Supersonic didn't miss and the Onyx didn't hit itself, it actually counted my stomp damage in the bide counter twice. Yes, Generation 1 is uh, completely broken and strange, and I love it so much. Still, even with that glitch playing out and Lickitung taking some damage, I managed to defeat the Onyx and clock him with a time of 10 minutes and 2 seconds. That's not a bad Brock split for a Pokemon that only has normal moves. As I journey out onto Route 3, I should explain badge boosts. If you look at the bottom left, you can see my current stats, and you'll notice that Lickitung's attack stat is higher than its special stat. In all my challenges, I'm playing with perfect Pokemon, so they have 15 in all of their DVs. So you'd expect that my special would be slightly higher than my attack, because Lickitung has a higher base special. But if you look at the attack row, you'll notice that there's a little badge icon at the far right. This is to signify the fact that Brock's badge is giving my attack stat a 12.5% boost. In Generation 1, there's a glitch around this boost. I'm sure if you've watched a lot of my videos, you know exactly how this works. But just in case you haven't, every time the player's stats are modified by a move in battle, or an item, say an X attack or something like that, the badge boosts that they currently have access to will be erroneously reapplied to all stats. So every time one of these bugs is using String Shot on my Lickitung, you can actually see that its attack stat increases. We get to see this in real time because of an awesome program called Gamehook, so check it out if you're interested. So now Lickitung's made it to Mount Moon, and in here there's some awesome TMs that it has access to. First is Water Gun, which is Lickitung's first special move, and then after that I get access to Mega Punch, which is a powerful same type attack bonus move. Because Disable and Supersonic are trash moves, I teach these two moves in their place, and then I defeat the Super Nerd, obtaining the Dome Fossil, this is the correct choice, and then I fight Jesse and James. This fight's easy today, and with that I've made it to Cerulean City. There's always a choice between either fighting the rival or fighting Misty in this case. For some Pokemon, if you defeat her first, you get access to the TM for Bubble Beam, which Lickitung would get access to in this case. But because of the badge boost that I previously mentioned, which makes my attack stat higher than my special stat, and the fact that all normal type moves are physical moves in Generation 1, I don't really think obtaining Bubble Beam now makes a lot of sense. Plus, Lickitung doesn't have any distinct advantages over Misty. It doesn't resist her powerful water type moves, and I don't have access to an electric move yet. So let's face the rival on Nugget Bridge. His Spearow moves first, it misses a Growl, which is perfect, and then Mega Punch just barely doesn't knock it out. Next it goes for Peck, and then I knock it out. Okay, this is really good that I didn't get hit by a Growl. Next is Sandshrew, I have Water Gun specifically for this thing. It unfortunately hits one Sand Attack. After that, his final two Pokemon are not really an issue in this fight. The Rattata does do decent damage with Hyper Fang, but Lickitung actually has a decent defense stat. So, I knock it out. Last is the rival's Eevee, and I take it out with two uses of Stomp. Now in all my playthroughs, I am timing myself to see how fast each Pokemon can beat the game. I end up recording a total of four metrics for each playthrough. Real time spent completing the game, game time spent completing the game, these two things are not the same, because I'm playing on a multiple of game speed, so I play at four times game speed. I also record the number of resets that I have, as well as the Pokemon's level when it finishes the game. Honestly, the fact that I record all these metrics and essentially I'm doing speed runs with every different Pokemon makes these challenges so engaging. And here on Nugget Bridge, I am realizing a distinct advantage that Lickitung has that will hopefully make its time much lower than it should have been. And that's the fact that this thing has outstanding PP. For example, if I don't want to use Mega Punch, I can just use Stomp, 
which is pretty much just as good. If I'm really running low on these two powerful same type attack bonus moves, I can use Wrap, which also has the same type attack bonus. And if those three moves don't work, I can also just use Water Gun, which does decent damage. Now most Pokemon make it all the way through Nugget Bridge without having to heal, and that's largely because there's an Elixir available on this route. However, for Lickitung, if you watch the top left, you'll notice that I don't even use this elixir, and I make it all the way to Bill's house, and I still have moves left over. As a result, when I head back to Cerulean City, I can just skip the Pokemon Center entirely. This saves about 5 seconds, because that's how long it takes you to heal in there. In Misty's Gym, I defeat the Junior Trainer with two uses of Mega Punch, and then I did end up using the Aether that I collected just before Bill's house to boost Mega Punch's PP. Okay, now let's face Misty. She leads with Staryu. I go for Mega Punch, it hits, and takes the Starfish down to red health. Okay, so I knock it out on the next turn. Lickitung levels up to 23, and then I had a choice to learn Defense Curl. Now this is my badge boosting move, so I really want it. I teach it in the place of Wrath because this move isn't very useful if I can't outspeed. Okay, time to defeat Misty's Starmie. I go for Defense Curl once to boost my attack stat, and then I use Mega Punch. Here's the thing. Misty doesn't seem to know what she's doing, she just uses X Defend and then Harden and I just knock Starmie out. So yeah, that's it. I've earned myself the second badge. Outside of the city, I defeat the rocket and earn the TM for Dig. Now I think it's really funny here that Lickitung can learn Earthquake and Fissure, but it cannot learn Dig. Like honestly, this thing could use its tongue as a shovel, I definitely think it should be able to dig. Maybe it's tiny little singular nails on each one of its hands, those could be used to dig with too. Like they wouldn't be super effective with dig, but it could do it I think. The SS hand's next, and you'll notice here that my Mega Punch is completely out of power points. That's because the last time I healed was when I first arrived in Cerulean City. I didn't heal after I beat Misty. And this is very intentional, because after I defeat this youngster and run out of Stomp PP, I pick up the TM for Body Slam, and then I can just spam A, teaching it to Lickitung in the place of Mega Punch. Yes, Stomp has less base power than Mega Punch, but the accuracy is totally the reason I don't want that move. After that, I backtrack to the other corridor of the ship, and there I pick up Rest. Just before the rival, I defeat the gentleman and pick up the rare candy. And now this next fight should not be an issue. The Spiro goes down to one body slam, the Rattata goes down to one body slam, I use Bubble Beam on the Sandshrew for super effective damage, and all that remains is Eevee. It does survive, but I just knock it out on the next turn. By the way, I used Bubble Beam there just to save body slam power points, because I would rather be using it, especially with Surge coming up next. He leads with Raichu. It moves first because I have like half of its speed, and it gets a huge mega kick. Oh my, that did so much. All right, it was a critical hit, but like, yikes. I go for Body Slam, it does just under half, and then the electric type uses Thunderbolt and knocks Lickitung out. Okay, Surge, well done. He's uh trying to have a redemption arc, I guess. In the next fight, he uses Mega Punch, which doesn't get a crit. My Body Slam gets a crit though, and then Raichu misses a Mega Kick and I finish him off. So Lickitung clocks in with a 23 minute and 41 second Surge split. The reward for winning this battle though is the TM for Thunderbolt. And with this TM, I can actually replenish my PP because I can teach Thunderbolt in the place of Stomp, meaning that once again, as I head out towards Rock Tunnel, I have not visited the Pokemon Center. I'm very confident now that Lickitung is going to make it all the way to Celadon City without having to heal. But first it's time for the wrapping lass. However, today she's easy because Body Slam can one-hit the Oddish and prevent Lickitung from being hit by a Stun Spore. In Rock Tunnel, the first Pokemaniac's easy because it can use Bubble Beam on the Cubone and Thunderbolt on the Slowpoke. Of course, the Self-Destructing Hiker's easy because I just used Bubble Beam three times, and with that there's only one more trainer before Celadon City, which is this Gambler. He is a mandatory trainer, I very rarely talk about him, but I just want to mention him in this case because yeah, look at my PP. I've got enough Bubble Beams to get through his fire types and arrive in Celadon City. So at this point, after Brock, Lickitung has only healed twice. I am really emphasizing this point because I think it's interesting, but it's not that big of a deal. I think this is somewhere in the order of 10 to 30 seconds saved. Now because Lickitung's stats aren't particularly outstanding, I spent some time in the Rocket Hideout collecting useful items. I can sell these to have more purchasing power in the department store, and that lets me buy 4 vitamins for Lickitung, and I choose 4 Carbos today. Like, Lickitung's speed is bad, and I need to give it as much help as I can. After all, in Pokemon Yellow, speed is very important in the mid-game. 
Having more than 45 is useful for Erika to outspeed all of her Pokemon, and then having more than 55 is useful for Koga so that I can at least outspeed all of his Venonats. Next I head to Pokemon Tower, and just before I fight the rival, I decide to teach Lickitung Ice Beam. It's usually at this point that Bubble Beam is no longer useful. The only reason you'd keep it around is if you really want it for Giovanni's Rhydon at the end of the game. But normally because that thing is so slow, I can just defeat it with an ice move. I fight the rival next, and this fight's very easy. I get the chance to learn a bodiless slam, but yeah, it's not going to be useful for Lickitung. After that, I rearrange my inventory, and then I have to go up against this Chandler, and like, we need to get a name for her because she is so annoying. She's the only mandatory Chandler that has this distinction. The reason she's so awful is just because Lick can paralyze, Confuse Ray obviously confuses, and then the Ghastly's Nightshade can do a lot of damage despite what your level might be. In this case, Ice Beam is the best move for me to use because it has the chance to freeze, which would essentially make these Ghastly a one-hit because you can't defrost in Generation 1. Still, without the broken status condition, Lickitung makes it through the fight. Okay, this thing is really starting to build momentum now. It has a fantastic moveset, and honestly, I really want to mention the fact that its HP stat is actually quite high. As a result, it has a lot of bulk, and I find that Pokemon that have a lot of HP and defense are a lot easier to use in the first playthrough. It tends to be that they end up performing worse than glass cannons overall, but if we were judging these Pokemon exclusively on their first playthroughs, I think that the slightly bulky Pokemon would actually produce better results. For example, I was able to get better results with my first Nidoqueen playthrough, whereas Nidoking performed slightly worse. Go check that video out if you haven't already seen it. Next, I head down Cycling Road, picking up some useful items like a hidden rare candy and PP up, and then I head into the Safari Zone. After all that's done, I head back to Erica's gym, and I defeat some trainers in here to level Lickitung up to level 33. This is so it has 46 speed, ensuring that I move first against all of the Grass Master's Pokémon. Erica leads with Tangela. Obviously Ice Beam makes the most sense here, and I freeze it, so that's perfect. And here's why, because now I can set up 6 defense curls for free, boosting Lickitung's attack stat, and now I can just use Body Slam. After all, my attack stat is 131, and my special stat is 61. This allows Lickitung to one-shot the Weepin' Bell, however, the gloom that follows does survive. I was scared that it was going to use Sleep Powder, but it just goes for Petal Dance, doing a little bit of damage, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, so that's my fourth badge. Now there's a choice as to what I can do next. I can go to Fuchsia City and fight Koga, or I can go to Saffron City and challenge Sylph. And in this case, the latter makes much more sense. Here's why. In Sylph, I get access to a lot of useful vitamins, which are going to boost Lickitung's stats. Plus, I don't actually outspeed any of Koga's Venonats at this current level. Also, after defeating the rocket that has Machoke, I get access to the TM for Earthquake, which yes, Lickitung can learn. I guess it just like stomps its feet on the ground and causes an earthquake or something like that. Or maybe it uses its tail. Like its tail looks very heavy. Look at that thing. Another move that it does have access to here is Swords Dance. Now, I also wanted to give the rival a try just to see if I could get through him. And I'm attempting this first fight without Swords Dance. After all, I thought that I could set up with Defense Curl on the Sand Slash. Turns out this isn't a really good idea because when it uses Slash, it does massive damage to Lickitung. Critical hits bypass all stat changes in this generation. I knock his lead out with Ice Beam, move on to the Cloister, hit with Thunderbolt, and it only does half. Alright, this isn't looking good. So that's Lickitung's third reset. Maybe this fight will be much easier if I teach Swords Dance. Now to fully set up my attack stat, I only need three turns. I sustain quite a bit of damage doing this against the Sand Slash. Luckily it misses a Sand Attack on the way. And then I use Body Slam. And it just barely doesn't KO. Like, ugh. I knock it out on the next turn. Cloister's next. Because Thunderbolt wasn't a one-hit last time and has like no hope of one-hitting, I go for Body Slam to see if it will knock it out. But Cloister's just like, nope, I have the highest defense in the game, and I'm like, yeah you do. So as a result, the following Magneton finishes me off. I tried again in the next fight because I figured I can use Ice Beam on the first turn against the Sand Slash, and I get the freeze that I was hoping for. This lets me set up with Swords Dance fully for free. I knock Sand Slash out, Cloister's next. In this case, it outspeeds, hits Clamp, gets a critical hit, doing so much damage, and uh, yeah, Lickitung actually does manage to survive. I strike back with Thunderbolt, it paralyzes, cutting Cloister's speed, I move first, and knock it out on the next turn. Okay, but the Magneton moves first, and it uses Supersonic, which is really scary, because if you're confused, you deal damage to yourself based on your attack stat. And my attack stat is very high right now. Body Slam takes the bolts out, and Kadabra is next. But it's faster, goes for Psybeam, 
and lick a tongue faints. All right, so I'm attempting this fight at a pretty low level. I think it makes sense to just do a little bit of training in Sylph. When Lickitung hits level 37, I decide to head back and face the rival again. I attempt Ice Beam to freeze the Sand Slash. I don't get it, so I have to set up Swords Dance while getting hit. And Sand Slash just like continuously crits, and yeah, Lickitung faints. All right, so my speed is 52. And I think after I defeat the two mandatory trainers in Koga's gym, that my speed might be slightly higher than at least two of Koga's Venonats, so let's try for that. However, just before the second juggler, it looks like I'm not going to level up, so I fight this tamer to get a little bit more experience. He paralyzes me with his Arbok, which is really frustrating, so I have to head back out to the Fuchsia City Pokemon Center and heal up. When I went back into the Fuchsia City gym, I was like, well, let me train on this guy over here. Like, he's got some psychic types. I should be able to knock them out quickly. And uh, then the drowsy confuses me with confusion. It's like, uh, and I hit myself. It hits a psychic, taking me to orange health. My body slam finishes it off, but the cadaver that's next moves first, uses Psybeam, takes Lickitung to red health, and then it knocks itself out. Well, that's not good. At least I saved in front of this juggler. Let's just fight him and open the way to Koga. And yeah then Lickitung loses again. So this thing stomped and slammed its way through the early game, and uh, yeah, now it's getting stomped by a lot of psychic types. As a Pokemon with a high attack stat, I really didn't expect this. I do get through the juggler on my next fight, and then I defeat one of the tamers in the gym, and this levels Lickitung up to level 39. And now Lickitung only has 55 speed, which is speed tied with his third Venonat. So to ensure that I move first, I use one rare candy, taking Lickitung up to level 40. Okay, now let's do this. Against Koga, the fact that I have a status condition is actually advantageous here, because I can set up and the first Venonat can't use Sleep Powder against me. After maxing out my attack stat, I move first against all the Venonats and one-shot all of them with Body Slam. Venomoth is last. Now, I just need to survive one hit from this thing. It goes for Psychic, Lickitung survives, I hit Body Slam, please no crit, it doesn't get it, and as a result, the moth faints. Well, that's a big relief, because that thing is a fighting fighting type, if you didn't know. Next, I head to Cinnabar Island. Here I can collect some vitamins, also the TM for Blizzard, which I think is going to be useful later on. And after that, I backtrack to Sylph to face the rival again. At level 40, I go for Ice Beam, and ah, oh, the Sand Slash still doesn't go down in a single hit. Like, uh, frustrating. Also, it didn't get frozen, so let's set up Swords Dance now and just hope this thing doesn't use Slash. Instead, this time, it just uses a lot of Poison Sting. Finally does go for Slash on the turn that I finish my setup, and then I'm ready to knock it out. Body Slam KOs. I go for Thunderbolt against the Cloister. Ah, oh, it just doesn't KO. Seriously. It hits with Aurora Beam, taking Lickitung down to red health, and then I polish it off. Magneton's next, I take it out with Body Slam, but Kadabra outspeeds and Lickitung goes down again. I leveled up a couple more times to 42 and then I try the rival again. At this level, I'm pretty sure Ice Beam is just going to one-shot the Sand Slash, so I decide to set up with Swords Dance instead. After that, I use Body Slam, it knocks it out in one turn, Cloister's next, Thunderbolt gets the KO now, that's good. Magneton goes down to a Body Slam. Now I set up with Sword Stance actually boosted Lickitung's speed, and because of this, I'm able to outspeed the Kadabra and knock it out with Body Slam. All that's left is Flareon. But because of an earlier Sand Attack, I miss with Body Slam. It goes for Fire Spin, also missing. That's fitting. And then finally I take it out. So Lickitung has cleared its way to the late gyms. I pick up the TM for Mimic, and then I head to Blaine's gym. Now in red and blue, Blaine is a complete joke, but in yellow he's very strong. And because of that, I'm going to use 6 rare candies before I fight him to take Lickitung all the way up to level 52. He leads with Ninetales. I go for Ice Beam first turn, which might seem strange, but in Generation 1, fire types don't resist ice moves. Also, I could freeze, which would give me free setup. Over the next turns, I set up fully with Sword Stance. This was a little bit risky because I was confused. Ninetales hits a big flamethrower, and I do hit myself during this time, but after setting up completely, I'm now faster than all of Blaine's Pokemon, and Body Slam 1 hits the Ninetales, 1 hits the Rapidash, and it doesn't one-hit the Arcanine because it gets a critical hit. It does cause paralysis, but Arcanine still moves, uses takedown, and finishes Ligatung off. And yeah, then I try the same strategy, and I lose again and again. So I saved before I used my rare candies so that I can use them after I level up more if I needed to. And in this case, I'll fight all the trainers in Blaine's gym to just get a few more levels. Now at level 47, I can use 8 rare candies to take Lickitung all the way up to level 55. 
This should be enough. At this point, you're probably wondering why I don't just teach Lickitung Earthquake. And the reason is, is that I don't really want to give up any of the moves that I currently have. After all, with the same type attack bonus, Body Slam is actually going to be doing more damage than a neutral Earthquake. Also, Ice Beam is going to be useful against Giovanni and then the rival before the league, and I can replace it with Mimic starting at Lorelei. Swords Dance, obviously I just never want to give up, this move is outstanding, and I want to keep Thunderbolt for Lorelei. So because of that in this playthrough, I was feeling locked into my current four moves. And while a neutral Body Slam is less effective than an Earthquake, a super effective Earthquake would be more effective here against Blaine's Fire-type Pokémon. Still, in the next fight, I managed to take the victory, and with that, I've earned myself the Volcano Badge, and with it, the last of the badge boosts. So, there's only two gym leaders left, and the first one is Sabrina. Oh, great. I guess it wouldn't be one of my videos if I didn't forget to heal. Abra goes for Flash, it lowers my accuracy, Body Slam misses, it hits Flash again, and then I knock it out. This is, uh, not going well. Now, Kadabra's next. And uh, this thing does no recover, so I'm going to try and mimic recover. And I just want to mention here that I unlearned Thunderbolt, and I have no idea what I was thinking in the moment when I chose this. Like, I was very clearly trying to save Thunderbolt for Lorelei, and then all of a sudden I'm just like, no, 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 I need mimic. That is clearly the move that I need for Sabrina. <laughs> oh, what was I thinking? Lickitung goes down. I try the fight again. This time I actually do manage to successfully mimic recover. <laughs> so weird. I guess what I was trying to do was mimic it so that I could have time to set up Swords Dance and then sweep her team, but like, I really only needed like one or two Swords Dances maybe here, and then I could have just swept anyways. After all, Lickitung is so slow that even three badge boosts doesn't give it enough speed to move first against the Alakazam. Well, either way, I take the victory. So now it's time to face Giovanni. This fight is going to be risky, and that's just because Lickitung is so slow. The Dugtrio could just KO me right away with Fissure. Luckily, it misses, after all 30% accuracy is just terrible. I get one Swords Dance set up. I did decide to go for another one. Fissure misses again. Perfect. Then Dugtrio gets a critical hit with Earthquake, which does about half, and I knock it out with Ice Beam. Okay, Persian's next. Usually this thing survives at least one hit, so I went for Ice Beam in case it freezes. It doesn't, and then I decided to fully set up with Swords Dance. I knock it out with Ice Beam on the next turn. Nido Queen's next. I take it down with Body Slam. Nido King also falls to a Body Slam, and all that's left is Ride On. I didn't level up, so I still have all my badge boosts, and as a result, Ice Beam does absolutely massive damage and finishes the Rhino off. So, I completed the gym challenge with Lickitung. The rival on Route 22 is next. Now, while this fight plays out, I just want to say here that I think I might be relying a little bit too much on Sword Stance. Yes, this move is fantastic, but consider a move set like Earthquake, Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, and Sword Stance instead. I could unlearn Ice Beam for Mimic at Lorelei and then sweep the Elite Four like that. Also, there is the potential to use a specially oriented. Lickitung, its moveset would look something like Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, Defense Curl, and Bubble Beam. Yes, I know Surf is good, but I really don't want it for the League. Water-type moves are just really not that good there. Either way, this is the set that I have now for the League, so let's do this. Lorelai's first and she leads with Dugong, which honestly is sort of perfect because this thing loves spamming rest. It gives me time to set up Sword Stance as a result, and then I knock it out with Body Slam. Okay, time for the Cloister, but with plus six, I knock it out with a single Body Slam. Slowbro's next, no need to waste time here mimicking Amnesia, I knock it out with Body Slam, the following Jinx falls in one hit, and so does the Lapras. Okay, so perhaps Swords Dance and Body Slam together was the right choice after all. The Hiker's next, and yeah, I can just use Ice Beam on the Onyx. I also set up against it because it's really weak, and then I can sweep the fighting types with Body Slam. And with that, I've arrived at Agatha. Now it makes sense to replace Ice Beam for Earthquake. First turn I go for Mimic, I steal Substitute. This way I won't be able to be confused, which is really important because I'm setting up my attack stat. After that, I use Earthquake and I sweep myself to a quick victory. Lance is next. He's one of the reasons that you either need Body Slam or Thunderbolt, because Earthquake can't hit his flying types. I figured today that setting up on the Gyarados and then just sweeping his entire team with Body Slam would make sense, but it gets a critical hit with Hydro Pump and knocks Lickitung out. In the next fight, I do manage to get set up fully. Body Slam 1 hits the Gyarados. Because I was taking a lot of damage in this fight, I decided to unlearn Earthquake and teach Rest in its place. This way, when I get to the second Dragonair, I can mimic Ice Beam and use this move to sweep through the rest of Lance's team. Plus, I can use Rest to heal whenever I need to. 
Unfortunately, Ice Beam doesn't one-hit the Aerodactyl. He uses Hyper Beam as a result, and Lickitung faints. However, in the next fight, everything lines up as it should. Body Slam one-hits all of the first three Pokémon, and then I take the Aerodactyl and the Dragonite out with Ice Beam. So Lickitung has made it to the champion. Because I have Rest, I figured that setting up against the Sand Slash would be completely safe. After all, Lickitung's defense stat makes it shrug off the Sand Slash's Earthquakes. However, Slash does a lot of damage, but with that I'm ready to strike back. Unfortunately, I level up to 63, resetting my badge boosts. I don't outspeed the Alakazam, it hits me, and then I knock it out. But now that I made it to the Executor with Rest, I can fully heal. It gets Leech Seed set up, and then I knock it out with Body Slam. Magneton's next, Body Slam takes it down. Cloister's next, I go for Body Slam, and I actually knock it out, and last is Flareon. I move first, hit Body Slam, and it faints. So Lickitung clocks in with a time of 1 hour 15 minutes and 4 seconds, with 15 resets at level 64. This took 4 hours and 19 minutes of game time. And now of course, I'm gonna fight Mewtwo, and I'll use this opportunity to talk about how I was feeling after this first playthrough. I looked at Lickitung's time, and I was like, I think that a sub-hour playthrough might be possible. Angie, Brian, and I talked about it, we went back, tested a bunch of different battles, and figured out better strategies for Lickitung to use, to shave off most of the resets. And I have to say, I was feeling very confident that a sub-hour time would be possible. And here's how it played out. I go into the Brock fight at level 11, and what I discovered here is that Rap is the best play against him. After all, I can potentially knock the Geodude out without even taking a single point of damage. This fight didn't go particularly well because it hits Lickitung twice before I knock it out and move on to the Onyx. Now here, Rap makes the most sense again. And the reason is, is that Bide doesn't accumulate as much damage with Rap. That means when I use Supersonic after Bide has started to accumulate, even if it deals damage to me, it doesn't deal very much. In testing, this fight went a lot better than it does here, but I still managed to defeat Barak on my first attempt. And Lickitung clocks in with a 5 minute and 52 second split. That is almost twice as fast as I was last time. By the time I make it to Misty, you'll notice that I have one reset, and this is specifically because I lost to a trainer on Nugget Bridge. It was really random, and there was no way for me to anticipate it. Another thing you'll notice here is that I have Seismic Toss with Lickitung, and this makes it much more consistent against Misty, because Mega Punch's accuracy is just terrible. Whereas at level 23, I can 2-hit the Staryu and 3-hit the Starmie. I defeat Surge on my first attempt. Next is Erika, and Lickitung again takes a first attempt victory against her. After this fight, I'm retaining most of the lead that I had from Brock. However, Lickitung is really going to need to gain a lot of time because I have to shave more than 15 minutes off the playthrough. But maybe I can do that with a more efficient late game. The first step in this is changing my mid-game moveset. For the rival in Sylph, I take Body Slam, Rest, Defense Curl, and Swords Dance into the fight. After all, I can teach Earthquake much later on to deal with the only ghosts on Agatha's team, and up until there, Swords Dance and Body Slam can deal with with almost all the opponents. Unfortunately though, because of Super Sonic, I lose the first fight against the rival today. I was playing kind of sloppily there. In the next fight though, things go according to plan and I take the victory. Now I defeated the rival to gain experience, and this way I have all the speed I need for Koga. After setup, Body Slam easily one-shots all of his Pokemon, I survive the Venomoth hit, and win. Now it's time for Blaine, and what I figured out against him is that I don't want to set up on the Ninetales, I just want to knock it out immediately with Body Slam. After all, I could paralyze it and cause it to miss moves. Then on the Rapidash, that can't lower my defense, and it can't confuse me, I can set up Defense Curl so that it does less damage to me with its hard-hitting physical moves. Moves. Of course, Fire Spin is a bit of a risk here, but I can always use Rest to get out of sticky situations. After I'm set up, I one hit the Rapidash with Body Slam, and one hit the Arcanine with Body Slam. Now, I tried sort of a meme play against Sabrina, which was to set up fully with Defense Curl, then set up fully with Sword Stance, and all the while be set up with Abra using Flash, which badge boosts me. I figured that this would make my special stats so high that Lickitung just couldn't be knocked out by any of her Pokemon, and I thought that Lickitung's incredible PP would be enough to knock her Pokemon out. But what I really was underestimating here is just how much Sabrina's Pokemon like to get critical hits, so yeah, that's a bit of an embarrassing reset. In the next fight though, I just prioritize setting up my attack, and with that I'm able to defeat her. Okay, it's time for Giovanni, and yeah, he beats me with Fissure on the first turn. That's ugly. I reset as fast as possible here to try and save as much time, because Lickitung has roughly 11 minutes left to clock in if it's gonna get the sub-hour time. 
Normally when you're at Giovanni, it takes about 10 minutes to beat the rest of the game, so things are looking very, very close. There are no rooms for error from this point. In this case, running both Defense Curl and Swords Dance gives me what I need to defeat Giovanni, because after I've set up with both, his Rhydon can't do much damage to me, so it can just knock it out over three turns with Body Slam. Having a move like Rest in combination with Defense Curl and Sword Stance is so nice because I have the sustain I need to set up and then sweep the opponent's team. Unfortunately though, the rival's Kadabra, yeah, it gets a critical hit with Psychic and knocks Lickitung out, like, ah, uh, I would have survived if it didn't crit me. However, there's a solution to this fight, which I should have figured out in testing, but I didn't. I can just use a rare candy to prevent the mid-battle level up. As a result, I outspeed the Kadabra, and I win on my second attempt. I defeat Lorelei, I defeat the Hiker, and then, for Agatha, I replace Defense Curl with Earthquake. After all, that move has outlived its usefulness. With this powerful ground move, I'm able to sweep her team and move on to Lance. For him, I teach Blizzard in the place of Earthquake. After setting up on the Gyarados, I'm able to sweep the rest of Lance's team. After all, this is easier now because I don't need to mimic a move later on in the fight. So I've made it to the champion, and the time is 58 minutes and 40 seconds. I am going to do this. After setting up on the Sand Slash, I can now knock it out with Blizzard, and then Alakazam outspeeds and hits a Kinesis before I knock it out with Body Slam. Now I just want to mention how painful that was, because Lickitung has 153 speed, and the Alakazam has 156 speed. So if I was like two levels higher, I would have moved first. Still, I'm able to one-shot the Executor, I'm also able to one-shot the following Magneton, and then on the Cloister, I decided to heal, because I don't always have the guaranteed one hit against it. When I wake up, I go for Body Slam, and it knocks it out. Okay, that's perfect. Lickitung levels up to level 62, and this resets its badge boosts. And look down at the bottom left. It has 99 speed. You know what else has 99 speed? Yeah, the Flareon. We are speed tied. When I was testing, my Lickitung was always moving first here, even though I leveled up. And I think what happened is I fought slightly different trainers throughout the playthrough, which gave me more stat experience in the first playthrough. As a result, the Flareon moves first, it uses Flamethrower, and takes Lickitung down to orange health. Body Slam misses because of Kinesis. I move first on the next turn, getting another chance for Body Slam, but it misses again, and Flareon uses Flamethrower. So yeah, Lickitung has to reset at 59 minutes and 30 seconds. Now I cannot even describe to you how my heart was pumping during this next fight. I was like, please, I can do this. I know I can do this. I one shot the Sand Slash. I one shot the Alakazam. I one shot the Executor. And then just before the Magneton comes out, the clock ticks over to one hour. Still, I'm able to see this through and defeat the rival. But yeah, Lickitung clocks in with a time of 1 hour and 12 seconds. It had 6 resets and it finished the game at level 62. This took 3 hours and 41 minutes of game time. Now, if I had eliminated those 6 resets, and maybe traded some of that time for a little bit more training, I'm sure I would have outsped the Flareon and won the first champion battle. And that would have given me a time under an hour. So, this was frustrating and disappointing. And I'm also really stubborn. So, of course I tried it again. Now I'm sure you're probably like, but Scott, I don't have time to watch a third playthrough. Don't worry, I'm gonna summarize the whole playthrough. Basically, my philosophy was, what if I actually cut levels and get to the champion even faster? However, the result of this was I had more resets throughout the playthrough, and I arrived here at basically the same time I was last time. And yeah, then I reset to the champion again, just once this time, like last time, and then Lickitung clocks in with a time of 1 hour and 38 seconds. Ah, oh, it had 11 resets and it finished the game at level 61, so that's one level lower. While watching this footage, it doesn't look like I improved things, but I really thought that I had improved the playthrough a lot. And so I decided to do a fourth playthrough. And this is the playthrough that never was. I got caught up filming other content, and then I had a complete technical meltdown behind the scenes when producing the Nidoran Female Versus video. I actually missed a week of releases as a result, and then my new overlay was so far into development that I wanted to prioritize filming Emerald content while I finished that up. And so, I boxed all this footage, and thought that I would never release this video. However, five months after I filmed the footage, I decided to come back and give Lickitung another chance to get the sub-hour time. So, let's jump into my fourth playthrough with it. Now, it is worth noting here that I played this playthrough as a first attempt playthrough. I didn't go back to my notes and research anything. I just went in and said, I'm going to figure out how to do Lickitung all over again. Maybe five months of knowledge will be enough for me to pull it off. 
After all, now I understand things like the damage rounding thresholds. I should also take the time now to explain my nickname for Lickitung. In all my first playthroughs, I give my Pokemon nicknames, and then in subsequent playthroughs, I give them just a single character nickname, because this renders faster on the screen, and hopefully shaves off a couple seconds in their overall playthrough time. The nickname Tongue Tied actually comes from Bulbapedia's trivia section, and it says that this was originally supposed to be its name, so I thought that was a cool piece of information that I wanted to include in the video. Plus, Tongue Tied is a really cute nickname for Lickitung. Okay, so let's summarize my choices in this playthrough. The early game is all largely the same as my first playthrough with Lickitung. I get through Surge without any resets and move on to the mid game. And at this point, I had decided that in this playthrough, I really wanted to see if I could beat the game without Swords Dance. After all, I think that in the previous playthroughs, I exposed myself to more risk by using that setup move, rather than just trying to beat the opponents with powerful moves from the start. Also, Defense Curl isn't that bad as a setup move because it boosts Lickitung's already decent defense, and then when paired with its high HP, it allows you to survive a lot of hits. Unfortunately though, one thing that I don't have a solution for is status conditions, especially sleep, and in this case I get put to sleep against Erica, and that's my first reset. I attempted to beat the rival at a lower level, but this doesn't work, I was just forgetting how to get through this fight. I even got a lucky freeze, I tried at level 38, and at level 40, but none of these things work. After that I move on to Koga, I get put to sleep here again, and the Venonat finishes me off, so that's my sixth reset. But in the next fight I get a lucky freeze, set up with defense curl, and then sweep through Koga's remaining Pokemon. Pokemon. And at Blaine is where I really realized that Swords Dance just feels better, because without it, even at level 50, Lickitung is struggling to get through this fight. I lost a total of 4 times against him, then I backtracked to Sylph, obviously here at level 50 the rival's very easy. I have to be lucky against Sabrina because of her speed, but I get what I need today to take a first attempt victory. After that I have to defeat Blaine, at level 52 I figured that I would be able to do this, and I do manage to get through the fight, but not in a decisive display, because Lickitung wins with only 5 hit points remaining. And then against Giovanni, I get the most absurd luck. I freeze the Nidoqueen, and then I set up 10 times with Defense Curl, eliminating Screech's debuffs, and fully maxing out my other stats. As a result, I'm able to knock the Nidoking out in one hit, and then I level up for the Rhydon, which is like really unfortunate. Ice Beam doesn't KO as a result, but I survive its Earthquake because of my Defense Curls. So as I'm defeating the rival and getting ready for the league, you can see that my time is not going to be under one hour. However, I still have optimism about my fifth and final playthrough. I know that we can get this silly-tongued pink cutie under an hour. In this playthrough, I have one reset on Lorelei and then I defeat her on my second attempt. Up next, of course, is the Hiker. I use Ice Beam to knock out the Onyx, and then I go for Ice Beam on the Hitmonchan. After all, it's gonna survive a Body Slam in this case. It doesn't knock it out, I take it out on the next turn. After that, it's time for Hitmonlee. It hits with Mega Kick, doing a decent amount of damage, then it outspeeds on the next turn hitting High Jump Kick, taking Lickitung down to red health. Alright. That's, uh, that's not good. Then Onyx goes for Rock Slide. Lickitung survives with six hit points, and I knock it out. Okay, all that's left is Machamp. I go for Ice Beam. It does about a third, and Machamp uses Submission. So obviously, I can just set up Defense Curl here, and that'll eliminate all of these problems. Sword Sense would also give me enough speed to move first on the Hitmonlee and avoid High Jump Kick. For Agatha, I teach Earthquake. Makes her very easy, and after that, I made it to Lance. Now, there is a small advantage here to not using Swords Dance. I don't really feel like I need to hold on to it, so I can just teach Blizzard and have four offensive moves on my moveset instead. Unfortunately though, without setup, the Aerodactyl does massive damage with a crit and the Dragonite finishes me off because of my speed. So in the next fight I decided to keep Defense Curl instead of having Blizzard, but like, this is not a good idea. I get back to the Dragonite at low red health. It misses a Fire Blast, Body Slam doesn't even do half because of a critical hit, and uh, yeah, then I don't knock it out and it knocks me out with Hyper Beam. So if I teach Blizzard in the place of Body Slam, it is the best choice for this fight, but overall I think we've determined that Lickitung should be using Swords Dance. It really seems like Swords Dance was the obvious choice, and I think it's really important when testing these things to use strategies that don't always seem like the obvious option, because sometimes they surprise you. However, in this case, that wasn't the case, so this whole playthrough looks kind of silly. I end up losing twice to the champion before I finally finish him off on my third attempt. In this fourth playthrough using Defense Curl instead of Swords Dance, Lickitung clocks in with a time of 1 hour 9 minutes and 50 seconds, with 16 resets at level 65. This took 3 hours and 59 minutes of game time. And now as I start my fifth and final playthrough, yes, this is the last one, I'll mention the technological developments that were achieved between these two sections of playthroughs with Lickitung. Tongue. So, number one, my overlay was all redone, and I did this just to make things like the stats and moveset more visible to users who are viewing these videos on mobile. And another tool that was finished in this time was RBY XP Router. 
This software lets me completely map out a playthrough so that I have exact experience and exact stats values, and so that I can know exact damage ranges against all of the opponents. So this final playthrough with Lickitung was optimized with that software. And here's what I discovered. I had pretty much figured out everything pretty well in my first three playthroughs until after Surge. Then for Rock Tunnel, I teach Lickitung Thunderbolt. Making my move set now Body Slam, Thunderbolt, Seismic Toss, and Bubble Beam. The clearest omission here is Defense Curl, and that's because of the fact that Lickitung is essentially going to play the game in three stages. The first stage relying on physical moves that are powerful like Stomp, Mega Punch, and Seismic Toss like we'll kind of include it in that group. After that, in the mid game, Lickitung is going to switch over to being primarily a special attacker with Thunderbolt, Ice Beam, and Bubble Beam. This middle portion of the game with special moves is actually quite short. Thunderbolt and Bubble Beam were both helpful throughout Rock Tunnel. And then I'm going to give up this moveset just before I fight the rival in Sylph. Here I've optimized my experience so I'm level 34 when I save for this fight, and then I can use 6 rare candies to take Lickitung up to level 40. And at this point I'm ready to switch into my final moveset, which is going to be Body Slam, Earthquake, Rest, and Swords Dance. In this case Body Slam and Earthquake are my attacking moves. Earthquake is useful if it's super effective, or if I'm facing a Pokemon like a Ghost. Body Slam is the better move if it's neutral, or if I know that it's a guaranteed 2 hit, and rolling for paralysis would make the fight more consistent. Swords Dance obviously gives me setup, and because I'm using Swords Dance, which creates a liability while I set up, I can use Rest as a form of recovery. Now in this case, I'm going to use Rest as sparingly as possible. I don't actually end up using it in this fight against the rival, and I take the victory. This gives me a little bit extra experience, and then I backtrack to Erica next. After all, with one use of Swords Dance here, both Body Slam and Earthquake get guaranteed one hits against her following two Pokemon, so there's no risk of sleep here. For Koga, I ensure that Lickitung is poisoned for this fight, that allows me to set up Swords Dance for free, and then I can use Rest to remove the status condition and sweep his remaining Pokemon with Body Slam. Okay, so it's finally time to take Blaine on with Earthquake. Now here it doesn't make sense to set up against the Ninetales because Confuse Ray and Tail Whip will mess me up too much. As a result, I just go for Earthquake right away and I get a lucky critical hit. Okay, that's good. However, now that Rapidash is next, I can use Swords Dance to set up because it could use Growl, which would just badge boost my other stats anyways. I get trapped in some Fire Spin here, but then I knock it out with Earthquake after getting plus two. Arcanine's next, I go for Earthquake, it doesn't quite finish it off. It hits a Takedown, taking Lickitung to red health. But my next Earthquake connects, and that's it. I finished Blaine off without any resets. Now I fought Blaine before Sabrina in this playthrough, specifically because I wanted the special boost, just to make her a little bit more consistent. Overall, this fight is mostly luck. It's just good that Sabrina's AI is like really awful, and she just spams random stuff that doesn't do anything, and I knock her Alakazam out. So with that, we've arrived at Giovanni, and I don't have good news about this fight. It's pretty random, and that's just because Lickitung's speed. There is nothing I could do about that. Feeding the maximum number of Carbos would not get my speed anywhere near close where it needs to be. Dugtrio uses a sand attack first turn this time. It's awful. I knock it out on the next turn. Then it's time for the Persian, and here I set up with Swords Dance. The unfortunate thing about that is that both Screech and Slash are awful. In this case, I get hit by Screech, then Slash, then Screech again. At least Screech is useful because it badge boosts me in combination with Swords Dance, which gives Lickitung enough speed to move first against the Nidoqueen. However, I level up for the Nidoking, and Giovanni uses a guard spec allowing me to take it out. Obviously I move first against his ace Rhydon, and because of my setup, Earthquake knocks it out in a single hit. Now to map out experience perfectly in the late game, I go for rare candies on Lickitung, taking it up to level 52 before the rival. After setting up Swords Dance, this fight is incredibly easy. And with that, I have made it to Lorelei at a time of 46 minutes and 15 seconds. So everything would have to fall apart from here on for Lickitung not to get a sub hour time. Because Dugong loves to set up, it provides me the opportunity to set up Swords Dance and then sweep her team. With a full setup, even the Cloister goes down in one hit. There's only one problem here, which is Jinx outspeeds, so it could freeze me with Ice Punch, but it doesn't in this fight, and with that I've taken the victory. Next is, uh, Bruno. Yes, he did defeat me once in this video, but with Swords Dance there is no risk. After all, once I get set up, then I can use Earthquake and Body Slam to sweep all of his Pokemon, yes, even the Machamp in one hit. Well, that is if I don't get a critical hit against it. Oh, its strength did a lot, but Lickitung survives and takes the victory on the next turn. Agatha is easy because I have Earthquake and Rest. Now Lance is next, and he's a little bit tricky. After all, Lickitung takes a lot of damage from his Gyarados. However, setting up Swords Dance, I'm usually able to get by it. The issue really comes at the end of the fight, because I want to go into the fight against Dragonite with decent health so that it can survive one of its attacks. In my first attempt, this doesn't happen, and he knocks me out. 
However, timing my rests just a little bit better in the second fight allows me to arrive with more than half health for the Dragonite. It hits, I survive, and I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, so all that's left is the champion, and by this point, Lickitung is really starting to fall off, even with an incredible move set like this. I do want to set up on the Sand Slash so I can knock it out with one hit, and as a result, I take a lot of damage from both Earthquake and Slash. However, because I'm a normal type, it's randomizing its move selection, so it could just use Fury Swipes or Poison Sting and give Lickitung the time it needs to set up. Also, I can use Rest to play around this and hopefully get a good sequence of turns to allow me to move on to the rest of the fight with decent health. Unfortunately, because of a critical hit, Lickitung goes down in my first attempt against him. That's my second reset overall. However, then in the second fight, I do manage to take the Sand Slash out, but the Alakazam gets a crit with Psybeam and knocks me out. However, in the third fight, I get what I need, knock the Alakazam out. However, with it out of the way, the hardest part of the fight is done. Now, I got a little bit risky here because I attacked the Cloister instead of using Rest. It hits Clamp, but luckily it doesn't hit enough times to take Lickitung out. As a result, I move on to the Flareon. It goes for Quick Attack, which is actually the correct move, but then the second turn it misses a Fire Spin and I knock it out. So, I did need some luck, especially in the final two fights, but Lickitung clocks in with a time of 52 minutes and 37 seconds, with three resets at level 59. This took three hours and 17 minutes of game time. So I was able to make the mid game all the way up until Giovanni very consistent. However, once I got there, I needed a little bit of luck, and then I needed more luck to get by Lance and the champion. However, overall, I really like this set with Lickitung a lot more than the other one. I am so happy that I was able to do it. I got Lickitung's time under an hour, and significantly so. So with these results, what placement has Lickitung earned itself in the tier list? Well, in this case, it was actually faster than Gyarados, and it was slightly slower than Clefable. So today, Lickitung earns itself the second spot in the A tier. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, and comment because I gotta read them all. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much, it means the world to me. Now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.